I'd like you to turn to St. Matthew's Gospel, 17th chapter. As it were, sharing on the words of Jesus, he said, anything is possible. Amen. That's what he said. Anything is possible. When we have sufferings, problems in our lives, and we are seemingly unable to change the circumstances of our life, God is not responsible. He's never made us victims. The devil makes victims of people. God never makes victims. Anything is possible. Always what we require, as the Word of God shows us, is growth. As we grow in the things of God, we are able to accomplish more and more. You know, a two-year-old boy and a 20-year-old boy are both fully humans. You agree with me? Now, just because he's two years old and the other one is 20 years old doesn't make him any less human than he is. A baby that's just been born, even though he cannot talk, he cannot walk, he probably hasn't even started creeping yet, is not any less human than a 90-year-old man. They're both perfectly human. The little child just has to grow. Now, as he grows, does he become more human? Talk to me. As he grows up, does he become more human every day? Do you look at that little child and you say, Oh, this little kid is growing. He's getting more human every day. He cannot get any more human than he was the day he was born. You agree with that? Good. The same thing with us and God. The day you were born again, you received into your spirit the life and nature of God. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. doesn't say he's going to be. The Bible says he is a new creation. Not he will be a new creation, but he is a new creation. Present tense. He is a new creation. And then he says, all things are passed away. He doesn't say all things shall pass away. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. He says, all things are passed away. Not all things shall pass away. But all things are passed away. And all things are become new. Not shall become new. Now, that is not a promise. It is a statement of fact. It is a present hour reality. Now God has to be right. Otherwise he's not God. If anyone knows something, it ought to be God. If God says all things are passed away, then I can say all things are passed away. Because God said it. I may not feel that all things are passed away. But that's the way God, that's the reason God said it to me. So I should think that way and talk that way. Hallelujah. He said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, he may have been born with an incurable heart disease. But now that he is born again, he is a new creation. He may have been born an essence. Now that he's born again, he is a new creation. He may still feel the symptoms that he used to feel before he was born again. It doesn't change a thing. 
The Bible says here, let God be true and every man a liar. In other words, any man who says something that's inconsistent with what God has said is lying. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, the truth, meaning the reality. What Jesus says to you is real. Everything else is but a shadow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, you know, a lot of times we think that we cannot do certain things because we are weak, we have some inabilities and so on and so forth. But that's not true. That's not what God says about us. And real Christian growth is learning God's word, developing in God's word, by practicing God's word, by doing God's word. The difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament in the way we relate to the word of God is that in the Old Testament they had to obey God's word. In the New Testament we do God's word. Now I'll show you the difference. In the Old Testament they were given laws and they had to obey as an instruction was given to them. They had to obey it. They had to struggle, struggle to act in obedience and they failed. They could not obey the word of God. In the New Testament, now, you see, the Old Testament couldn't give them the life of God. That's what they didn't have. You know, if you were acting, if you were, if you were playing a role that's not your natural life, if you're a man, for example, and you act to dress like a woman and act on stage, you could try. But when you're off the stage, you cannot really continue every day of your life acting that way because it's not real to your nature. You understand? If you try to bark like a dog and you, you try the whole day, you may, even, you may even succeed for a day. But the rest of your life, you cannot keep acting a dog. You understand? Because it's not your nature. Now, God gave them laws to obey in the Old Testament. And they tried, but they did not have the nature of God. Because the Word of God in the Old Testament did not give them life from the law. Hey, come on. Are you hearing me? He couldn't give them life from the law. The Bible says, if there had been a law given that could have given life, righteousness should have been by the law. But there was no law given that could give life. So they tried to obey God's word. And they couldn't. Because they didn't have the life to obey it. Then in the New Testament, and, and that's the fault that God found with the Old Testament. Not because it was imperfect, but because it could not give life. That's the fault he found with the Old Testament. And so in the book of Hebrews it tells us, if there had been no fault found in the Old, there would have been no need for the New. He says, but he found fault with the Old and brought in a new one. Now the new one gives life. You begin in the New Testament by receiving the life and nature of God into your spirit. And once you receive that life into you, it becomes perfectly natural for you to do the things of God. Perfectly natural. You don't have to struggle to do wrong. In fact, you have to be tempted to do wrong. You, cannot be, you don't have to struggle to do right. You have to be tempted to do wrong. But in the Old Testament... They had to be pressured to do right. They couldn't. All the time they lived in the wrong way. They tried, they made efforts to live right. But in the New Testament, when you receive the life and nature of God, you don't have to struggle to do right. It's your nature to do right. Righteousness becomes your nature. And so he tells us, him who knew no sin, God made to be seen for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
we have become the righteousness of God in Christ. Not only are we his righteousness, now, now I could preach for a whole month in that, but it says we are the righteousness of God in Christ. That's one of the biggest statements you could ever have. It's powerful. It means that we are the demonstration of God's righteousness. It means that you can look at us and see the perfection of God. Oh, if the church would ever rise up to grasp that truth, that reality, it will make masters of every one of us. Hallelujah. Masters over circumstances of life. Masters over demons, disease, and hell. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's so important that we understand the word of God. But then it says, that they who receive the abundance of grace, Romans chapter 5 verse 17, and the gift of righteousness, the gift of righteousness. He doesn't tell us to qualify for righteousness. He says the gift of righteousness. He says they shall reign in the realm of life by Jesus Christ. Now the translation says they shall reign as kings in this life by Jesus Christ. They who receive the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. Righteousness is the nature of God. It gives us the ability to do right. And it gives us the ability to stand in the presence of God without a sense of guilt or inferiority or condemnation. We can stand in the presence of God without fear. Praise God. Without feeling inferior. We can stand in the presence of God. Boldly behold in his face. Glory to God. In the same vein. If we can stand in the presence of God by virtue of our righteousness in Christ Jesus, we can stand in the presence of Satan and the cohorts of hell in boldness without any fear. Can you see that? We have become masters over Satan. Thank you Lord Jesus. Praise God. That's the reason we can stand before any kind of disease or sickness. We're not afraid we'll catch the flu. See, you have to be ignorant to be oppressed by the devil. When you come to the knowledge of the truth, you have no fear anymore. The Bible says, perfect love cast out fear. Glory to God. So in the New Testament, when you have the life of God, you do the word of God. It's so wonderful, just so beautiful. You don't try to obey, you just do. See, all of what he tells us in the epistles are the pictures of the new creation. It's like an album, you understand? And you're looking at the pictures of the new creation. You just look at you. Thanks beyond the God who gives us the victory. Hey, and, and when you study that, in the New Testament, the sense in which he gives it to us is to understand that God has given us the victory. We don't try to get the victory. We don't hope to be victorious. We don't pray to be victorious. We don't look forward to victory. Hallelujah. We are the victorious ones. You understand? So we, we just step into what he's already called us to be. The Bible says, as we look at the glory of God in a mirror, as we look, as we behold the glory, as we look at the glory of God in the mirror, and now let's just understand, we are the glory of God. Hallelujah. Your life may not look glorious, but if you begin to understand this teaching, you will see the glory. He says, as we look at the glory of God in the mirror, we are metamorphosed. We are changed from glory to glory. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell somebody anything is possible. Anything is possible. Just get to know who you are. Find out what belongs to you. Find out what you can do. And where you are. In Christ Jesus. Praise God.
Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to read to you from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 17. I'm reading from verse 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? Now we're talking about a certain situation. You remember the disciples of Jesus one time were together and a man came to them. Jesus had stepped aside uh, where he was praying with three other disciples. And this man came with his son who was epileptic. Plus daddy had a deaf and dumb spirit. So he asked the disciples to cast the devil out of his son and they could not. They tried and they could not. And then while they were still there struggling with the devil, Jesus came. And the man approached Jesus. He said, Master, I brought my son to you. And uh, I got to meet your disciples and asked them to help me cast the devil out of him and they couldn't. Please, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, it's not a question of if I can do anything, it's if you can believe anything. Praise God. And that's in St. Mark's Gospel, the ninth chapter. He said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe it. Hallelujah. Well, Jesus then cast the devil out of the boy, and he was cured, and he restored him to his father. So in the 19th verse, the Bible says, Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? How come we couldn't cast the devil out? Why couldn't we do it? And, you know, a lot of times when we study or when we hear that we can do anything in Christ, we wonder, why couldn't we do something then? Why didn't I get the job? Why did we lose the baby? Why did we lose the pregnancy? Why did we, why did we lose that admission? I thought I got the admission to that school. Why did we lose it? Why did we lose the house? Why did we lose the car? Why couldn't we make it? Well, we prayed for the man and he still died. Why did he die? We tried everything. That's the kind of situation that the disciples found themselves that day and they came to Jesus and they said, Master, why couldn't we cast the devil out? Because they had done everything they had seen Jesus do. Otherwise, they wouldn't have asked him. They thought they had done everything. They said everything he said. When he cast devils out. And then when he came... When he cast the devil out, they wondered, well, but that's exactly what we did. So why couldn't we cast, why, why couldn't we cast him out? Jesus didn't do anything different from what they did when he came. Otherwise, they would have said, oh, master, we see now. We see now. Something you did, we didn't do. But they watched him, and when he was through, they said, hey, come on. But we did the same thing. Why couldn't we cast him out? Hallelujah. Well, Jesus pinpointed something they didn't see. And, you know, often it's something we do not see. Because we have a lot of assumptions in our lives. And we sometimes uh, we look at it in a myopic way. But look at this, verse 20. Jesus said unto them, because of your own belief. Did you see that? He said, because of your own belief. In other words, anything is possible. If it didn't work, it was not faith. Period. Faith always works. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Look at the way Jesus ministered. Why didn't they tell the the, the father of the boy, take your boy home, the devil is gone. They were struggling. They wanted to see something come out. Well, look at it. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, and this is powerful, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hands to yonder place. And it shall remove. Don't come back and say, well, I said it and it didn't go. When you say that, you are telling Jesus, Master, you are not exactly right. I know better. I said what you said to say and it didn't work. You're telling Jesus he lied. Jesus didn't say, when you say to the mountain, remove, watch and see it go. He said, when you ask it to go, it's gone. You ought to act as though it's gone. 
You want to talk as though it's gone. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this cancer, remove from my body. And it shall remove. Jesus never lied to anybody. He never exaggerated his words. When he spoke, it was absolute reality. He said, I am the way, the reality, and the life. Hallelujah. If you have faith as a grain of... You, you know, he's not talking about having a great, great faith. Faith is not given to you great. It's given to you small. It's a little seed. And everybody's got it. If you're born again, you have faith. The Bible says he has dealt to every one of us in the body of Christ the measure of faith. The measure. Definite article. He's given us the measure of faith. The same for everybody. And then you grow your faith. Hallelujah. That's your responsibility. You've got to grow your faith. Have you ever seen a little baby with a V chest? Talk to me now. Have you ever seen a very little baby with great muscles? Those muscles are built. Have you ever seen a little baby with great pot belly? It's built too. <laughs> it's built. If you eat the right things, you build it. So I said, well, I don't want to build that. Well, there's a lot of people building that. Hallelujah. It's built. God gives you everything. Hey, have you seen an orange seed? How many of you have ever seen an orange seed that has a stem? You've never seen an orange seed with a stem. But brother, that little orange seed has in it the potentialities to produce the roots, the stem, the branches with leaves on them. More fruits with a multiplicity of seeds in them. You see that? That's the way you are. Everything, the Bible says, everything that you require for life and godliness has been given to you. It's all in you. Tell somebody, look in words. Look in words. Look in words. There's a king inside you. <laughs> Glory to God. Woo! Glory. Hallelujah. Look inwards. Success is in you. Look inwards. You don't need to look around you. Look inwards. It's in there. Sure. Hallelujah. It's there. It's there. Oh, glory. How happy was I many, many years ago when I found out that my destiny was not in the hands of anybody. I found out from the Word of God I could be anything in this world. I could go anywhere. See, your problem, your problem is not the embassy. Your problem is not the nation you come from. The, uh, glory. Nobody is your problem. You are your own problem. Look at it again. He said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, if you have it, read it with me now. Come on. Just look at it while I read it to you. As I think it is in your Bible. Okay, verse 20, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto God. Uh, ye shall pray the prayer of prayer warriors. 
Oh, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall shout loud enough for the devil to hear you. Oh, ye shall beg God to take the mountain out. See, all of that prayer you're praying, Oh God, take away this thing from me. Oh God, take away this thing from me. Oh God, remove it from me. You are wasting your time. I've seen them cry like that and didn't change. Oh God, please take it away from me. Take it away from me. Take it away. Take it away. They think that, you know what Jesus said? He said, don't pray like the heathen who think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. He said, it's the heathen that prays like that. Take it away. Take it away. Take it away. Take it away. That's the way the prophets of Baal pray. God, you see, God doesn't hear you because you got a lot of words to speak to him. He said, if you have faith, if your faith is faith, he said, you say to the mountain, talk to the trouble. Not talk about the trouble. Stop talking about your pain. Stop talking about your lack of job or lack of money. Stop talking about the problem of your wife. Stop talking about all the problems you got in your body. Stop talking about the flu. Talk to the problem. God said, Ezekiel, Solomon, can these bones leave? Ezekiel said, Lord, you are the only one who knows. He said, all right, let's do something about it. He said, son of man, prophesy to the bones. He said, talk to the bones. Say, oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of God. Man, oh my. Wow. God's always let us understand he is not the problem. He is with us. He said to Moses, first, he said, now, you stretch your hand over the water and divide it. He didn't say stretch your hand over the water and pray to me and I'll divide the Red Sea. He said, Moses, I want you to stretch your hand over the Red Sea and divide it. Go ahead and do it. The next time when they wanted water, he said, Moses, tell the rock to give you water. Oh, God. Dear, dear, dear Lord. He said, tell the rock to give you water. Tell the rock. They have been crying, oh God, we don't have water. The people are starving to death. God said, Moses, tell the rock to give you water. Now he tells Ezekiel, talk to the bones. These bones were very dry. That means everything that God has created has intelligence. Are you hearing me? Everything in this world has intelligence. The rock has intelligence. Are you hearing me? Moses already proved that. Dead bones have intelligence. Jesus talked to a tree. The tree has intelligence. Brother, your body has intelligence. Talk to it. You know, in a lot of places, they, they always need counseling and counseling because they don't hear the word of God. Always, you know, they've got, they, they got to get this counseling from this area of their life and the other area of their life that's going through some problems and this and th If you receive the word of God and act accordingly, you got no problems. And let me tell you this. You can only carry someone on your faith for a while. How many of you would like to carry a 15-year-old boy on your shoulders like this? He's your son. He's 15 years old. You like to feed him with a feeding bottle? He's 15 years old. If your marriage is being shattered by the devil, instead of quarreling with your wife or getting mad at your husband, get home and tell the devil out. It's wrong for you to say, well, I really want to stay in this marriage, but my husband just cannot accept me. My wife just cannot. If both of you are Christians, something is wrong with the two of you. (laughs) 
Something is wrong. Get the devil out. We are not supposed to be victims. You say, well, I have three sons. The third one has no brains. You took his brains. Well, I'll show it to you from the Word of God. You took his brains out. Because God gave him brains. When you began to say he didn't have no brains, you got rid of his brains. Oh, now you're dead quiet now. You're looking at me. Oh. All right. You still here? If you have faith. Tell somebody if you have faith. As little as a grain of mustard seed. You can do anything. <laughs> do I like it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let me read that to you. It says, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hands to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Oh, glory. Great news. And Jesus proved it. He proved it. Hallelujah. Well, can we go for more? You know, if you notice something that he said there, he, he said, He shall say unto this mountain. He didn't say he shall fight the mountain. He said, say. If you got faith, he says, talk. Talk. If you really have faith, talk. Tell somebody, talk. Say it again, talk. talk. If you have faith, talk. Talk, faith, talk, 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 talk. talk, talk. talk. Say, so talk is not the same as cry. <laughs> I don't know why I'm going through all this. Nobody likes me. I don't know why I'm going through all this. You ought to go through it. It seems to be your lot. Why? Because you love it. You know some people love sympathy. Oh, they're sympathy seekers. They love it. You know, when you get sick, everybody turns to you. They may not go to work because of you. And this is the way you get your own attention. Suddenly they help you with the water, they help you with the food, they help you with your clothes, they help you with everything. Because, you, because if you don't do that, they don't care if you exist. Some men know how to do that to their wives and some wives know how to do that to their husbands too. And some children know how to do it cool. It's very simple. If you've not been eating eggs and bread, there's a way to handle mummy. Just... <sighs> By the time you do it, no breakfast, no lunch. You refuse everything. She's going to ask you, what do you want to eat? <laughs> and you're just going to say, bread and egg. You are sure to get it quick. They'll make it quick. Is that a recommendation? No. No. What I'm telling you is, you are training the devil in how to handle you. Those of you who like playing with sickness, you, you, you love it. Aren't you coming to work today? No, I, I'm, I'm sick. I'm, I'm sick. It's terrible. I'm sick. You know you're not sick. I'm sick. The headache, you know, yesterday's ghost slow was so terrible. The headache. I feel, I, I don't know if I'll be able to come today. You've just bought something. 
And you know what? You call it from afar. It may not strike immediately because it doesn't run too fast. But it's sure coming. It's not there yet. But trouble is on the way. It's coming. So where are you going? So somebody's calling me over there. Hey, is there any, any, any professor or doctor, you know why people die? Tell me or write me. You know why people die? I understand from 7 to 11 years, every 7 to 11 years, depending on um, several other factors, Every cell in your body is replaced. Your life, your whole body is renewed. Which means 11 years ago, all the cells that you have today didn't exist. Your body ought to have been renewed. If that is true, which means God has already established a proper system for the human body, to be healthy and sound. So why do they die? Why do they age and die? When everything is coming up new. Every 7 to 11 years. So why do they age and die? I'm not talking about accidental deaths and so on and so forth. I'm talking about why do men just grow and live out their lifespan? Why, in fact, is there a lifespan? Why a span? Why do they die? The doctors don't know. It's no use to try to write me. You don't know. The truth is, it's because of the curse. You see that? Because of the curse. That's why. Oh, glory, 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 glory. Oh, glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Sickness is not a part of your life. It's not a part, it's not an everyday... See, some people are so used to malaria, they get malaria every once in a month or every... You know, somehow, before the year runs out, there must be some sickness. Some people are so used to it that they believe everybody gets sick. We ought to be sick sometimes. No. It's not true. Are you hearing me? It's not true. Somebody says, well, you cannot always be joyful. Sometimes you'll be happy, sometimes you're not. See, they speak out of their own experiences. And they think that that's what life should be. Why don't you study the word of God? Who are you following? If you follow Jesus, you discover life in its entirety. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, of his fullness, John 1, 16, of his fullness have we all received in grace for grace. We have received of his fullness, his fullness of life. We have received that. The Bible says we are partakers of the divine nature. This is wonderful. The divine nature. We are partakers of the divine nature. You remember in the Garden of Eden, the Bible tells us when you study Genesis chapter number 2, and um, you read in verse 9, the Bible tells us that there were, that, that God made so many beautiful trees to grow in the garden, and they were good for food, and they were good, you know, just so beautiful. And then, there were two particular trees that he mentioned. He tells us, that there was in the midst of the garden a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Amplified Version says of blessing and calamity. Terrible. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then also in that garden was a tree of life. Can I tell you what the tree of life was for? Awesome. 
awesome. God is wonderful. Tell somebody, God is wonderful. God is wonderful. Oh, wow. God is wonderful. You know, when man ate of the tree of the uh, knowledge of good and evil, which God forbade man from eating at the time, they shouldn't have. When they did that, the Bible tells us that they fell from grace. Simply put. And so, they had to be driven away from the garden. God said, I don't want them to eat of the tree of life. Now that they have done the wrong thing. Because they would have been irredeemable if they had done that. You, you couldn't redeem a man by death. Like the death of Jesus. A man who couldn't die. You couldn't redeem him by death. Because the law of God is the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And so if someone's going to pay the penalty, that one has to die. And the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, it's no remission of sins. And if the man can't die, how are you going to remit his sins? It will become impossible. So God said, don't let them eat of the tree of life. Drive them out of the garden. And they were driven out. Now, the tree of life still exists today. You say, where is it? God knows. If he didn't let nobody go there, nobody can get there. Praise the Lord. But the day is going to come that we shall all eat of that tree of life. But you see, what God did was, through Jesus Christ, he brought up a spiritual kingdom. And that's our kingdom. Praise God. He brought up a spiritual kingdom. We don't have to look around for the tree of life. What we have to do today is to do what the Word of God says and have the benefits of the tree of life. Are you hearing me? Alright, let me show you first what that tree of life was supposed to do for you. And what it is going to do at the end of time. Praise God. Book of Revelation chapter number 22. Somebody said, ah, Revelation. I don't like reading Revelation. Somebody said, well... He heard that his friend or his friend read Revelation and, and he turned mad. How can he turn mad for reading the Word of God? Well, I've been reading Revelation. I haven't turned mad yet. Are you ready? Oh, I like it. Oh, beautiful. And verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bore twelve manner of fruits. How fantastic. Think about it. Twelve different kinds of fruits. Have you ever seen a tree like that? I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus. He's so wonderful. Aren't you looking forward to seeing him? Well, he says, it bore twelve manner of fruits, and yielded have fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for what? The healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. That's the curse. That's destroying men today. But if you're born again, you're out of that curse. Verse says, the, the, the leaves of the tree of life were for the healing of the nations. Now, for our spiritual kingdom today, until we eat of that tree, today, there's something we can do. Proverbs chapter 15. Have you found it? All right, I want to read to you verse 4. Or shall we all read it together? Want to go. He says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Now, another version says, A healing tongue. Does anybody's Bible have that? Who's got that? Anyone? Few of you. All right. He says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Is a tree of life. 
It gives life. But perverseness in the tongue is a breach in the spirit. Now, that's terrible. It means contrariness in the tongue. In other words, when the tongue begins to say the wrong thing, it's a breach in the spirit. It's a breach. There's going to be trouble. You're going to have problems. That's what he's saying. But a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Giving life, giving healing, bringing blessings. But the tongue that speaks contrary wise, that says the wrong thing, is a breach in the spirit. So you find in the realm of the spirit, you're going to be producing problems for yourself. You may not see them until you begin to inherit them. You begin to inherit them. Let me show you something else. Proverbs chapter 18. You all read verse 7 together. One to go. Did you see that? Again. A fool's mouth is his destruction. And his lips are the snare of his soul. His lips are his trap. He becomes a captive because of his own words. His own words are his destruction. Hey, has anybody, has anybody, talk to me now, has anybody been born a fool? Have you ever seen a baby? A little baby, and that mother holds that dear little one in her little hot hands, and she says, oh, I've given birth to a fool. (laughs) Have you ever seen that? Ever seen somebody, they say, oh, you know why he's such a fool? He was born that way. He was born a fool. You seen somebody born a fool? Nobody's born a fool. They grow up to become fools. You still there? Nobody's born a fool. So he, he became a fool. I guess, you know, in, in our lives, sometimes we are, we leave everything to God, you know. We say, um, if I get the job, it's God who did it. If I don't get it, it's God who didn't do it. Um, if I, if I get there, thank God. If I don't, then it's God. So we are used to giving it all to God. It's God, it's God, it's God. If I'm well, it's God. If I'm sick, it's God. Maybe God put this on me to discipline me. Maybe God made me sick um, to keep me at home. Maybe God made me sick um, Maybe God made me poor, so I would not become proud. Have you, have, you, have you seen them? They believe God made them poor, so they will be humble. I love Shambak. He said a lady came to him and said, Hi, Brother Shambak. God put this sickness on me to make me humble. And then he said, wonderful sister and put his hand on her and said dear God give her more of it and make her more humble he said I don't want more of it he said what why God gave it to you and God will ha- rather have you more humble she said no I don't want any more of it have you been to the doctor to get rid of it oh yeah why would you go to the doctor to get rid of something God gave to you it's not from God Hey, come on. I said, it's not from God. I've seen Christians, you know, you, they're angry about divine healing. They said, divine healing is not for today. Miracles are not for today. And then they pray. Lord, as I travel, be with me in my journey. And they don't see God. They're asking for a miracle. And yet they said, the day of miracles is past. Well, I don't I believe everything but all that prosperity. I don't believe in it. Well, okay, I believe in general prosperity. Everybody, you know. Do you? Why do you want a better job? 
He want to prosper some more. No, just to, oh, oh, just to take care of my family. That's all. I, how selfish you are. You want to take care of your family. What about other families that can't be taken care of? Why can't you earn some more money and take care of some others, including yours? Selfish. I want to take care of my family. Who will take care of their family? No, God knows how to take care of them. All right, you stay at home. Let that God take care of you too. Can you understand it now? We ought to be prosperous so that not only can we handle ourselves, but we can look around and help somebody else who's not been as blessed as we are and become a blessing to them. Can you say amen? Yeah. That's what prosperity is all about. The rich give jobs to the poor. The poor can give no jobs to the poor. Come on, talk to me. Someone says, I don't like no rich man. I want to kill every rich man there is. All right. You want to actually kill every poor man because the poor is dependent on the rich. And you eliminate the rich, the poor will die because they're already poor with the rich being present. Now the rich is gone. Who can help them? They will die. <laughs> Only the rich can make the poor rich. Hey, come on, talk to me now. Isn't that true? Yes. Never get mad at a rich man. Thank God for the rich. Because he couldn't be rich until there was a poor man. Because the poor man serves the rich. And the poor man helps the rich get richer. And then as the poor helps the rich get richer, the poor gets richer too. Because he keeps serving. And as he keeps rising. And if he continues long enough and he's wise, sooner or later, he'll begin to help some others. And who will help him too? And he'll become rich. But you know something? A lot of times the poor can be so foolish. He's so angry with the rich. <gasps> mm. Mm. Then he starts singing stupid songs. No condition is permanent. <laughs> Who is he singing it for? For the rich. He's singing it for his boss. As he cleans the louvers. No condition in this world is permanent. Why don't you sing it to you? If you sang it to you, you would not sing it with pity. You would sing it with joy. Knowing that though you're here today, you're going to rise and get better. Hallelujah. Are you still here? Alright, let me show you just another scripture. Oh boy. Ho, ho, ho. Proverbs in chapter number 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Brother, whether you live or die, it's in your mouth. Oh, this sickness will kill me, please. It's really going to kill you. No doctor can help you. I can assure you of that. You are sure going. You're going. It's no use asking for healing. You're going to die. You can write it down. You are sure going to die. And that very soon. Because you, you are helping. You, death and life are in the power of... You know, even some mothers. Ah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. All over the place. All the children. Five of them crying all over. You people will kill me. Oh. Hmm? She's likely to die by reason of the kids. Not that they're going to hold something to kill her. They're going to act in a way that will eventually kill her. Just growing up mad. Get on drugs. Do some stupid things. Until the mother loses her mind. Or she has some heart trouble. High blood pressure just because of the children. Hypertension. And every day she prays, it's her children. Oh God, I don't ask for anything, only my children, only my children. She, she can't ask for anything. Oh, every day, oh God, it's my children. Oh God, it's my children. Children that were supposed to be a blessing to you have become a curse. How did you get here? How did you arrive at this point in your life? It's your mouth. It's your mouth. How many of you have ever seen a sheep? I'm not talking about, 
I'm talking about sheep. Have you seen a sheep? If you haven't seen, go to a papa. <laughs> and look from there, you will see sheep. Right? Now, you know that the captain of that sheep, is that right? The Bible talks about him and says that the captain with a little helm or rudder can turn the direction of that sheep. Alright? Now think about this captain. He's there and there's a rock ahead. And he starts crying out to the guys behind. Hello, folks! Looks like we're going to hit the rocks! I think we're going to hit the rocks! And he keeps going. It appears we're going to hit the rocks! What are you going to say to him? Shut up! And turn the rudder! Isn't that what you're going to say? It's wrong for him to keep shouting. Looks like I'm going for the rocks. Now, if he doesn't do something with that little helm, he will surely hit the rocks. You know what the Bible says? Your tongue is that little helm. And you are the captain. That's James chapter 3. Your tongue. He's telling you, if you see your life headed for the rocks, you're going. Looks like everything's getting darker. Your life doesn't seem to be getting any better. Hey, hey, use your tongue. Come on. Change the direction of your life. For example, somebody's got HIV. Can't you see that you are headed for the grave? You're going. And you can see that the way you're going... You can see that the way you're going, the sun going to carry your, carry your coffin. You know they're going to dig down there and they're going to put you in there. You can see it. You see, the, you, you, you see a few folks crying and some others are happy you're gone because they're tired of suffering. So, what are you going to do? Hey, God is telling you, use your tongue and change that direction because you can. You can. You can. You see yourself headed for the downward life. Use your tongue. Change the direction. Come on. Hey, come on. You can change it. Jesus said, and nothing. Hey, I like it. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. And nothing. Jesus said it. If anybody knew what reality was, it was Jesus. Because he himself was the embodiment of reality. He said, and nothing.